Bora lá. Muito bem. Gente, quem acompanha o Contra to Culture há bastante tempo, eu sei que muitos de vocês o fazem, a gente recebe convites e conversa. Quando é que vai ser? Que data? É, eu acho uma delícia saber que as pessoas colocaram na agenda desse primeiro trimestre o Contra to Culture. Vocês sabem que a The Ready é uma consultoria. É, eu vejo por aí os slides tradicionais né, da rotatória e do semáforo, acho que é uma referência em cultura de aprendizagem quase. E a The Ready é uma, é uma grande inspiração para a gente. E ela está fazendo um trabalho em futuro do RH brilhante. E a gente tem a honra de trazer aqui, mais uma vez, a Rodney Evans. Ela é uma pioneira, e a colinha aqui de novo, gente, em design cultural adaptativo e futuro do trabalho. Tem 20 anos de experiência com trabalho de transformação corporativa. Ela pesquisa, ensina e desenvolve um monte de novas formas de trabalho e sempre com foco em ambientes complexos. Né? Ela é parte da consultoria americana The Ready e ajuda a empresa a modernizar as práticas e vai hoje compartilhar com a gente um trabalho que ela está fazendo sobre o futuro do RH. Podemos colocar a Rodney na nossa tela. Hi, Rodney. How are you? Hello. How are you? It's so nice to see you and to be back. Good to see you again. Thank you a lot for you to spend your time with us again. And we are so interested to hear about the work you're doing, the, the future of HR. So the stage is yours. Fantastic. Okay. So you all have my presentation okay up there? Do we? Tá certo aí em cima? Yes. Yes, there's someone doing like this here. Everything perfect. Fantastic. Perfecto. Okay. So y'all, thank you so much for having me back here. I love this conference. I'm super excited to talk with you about the future of HR and why I believe that it requires revolution, not evolution. I think it's time for us to go from firefighting to future proofing. But first, we have to burn a few things down. I started my career in HR because I cared about people and relationships, and I really wanted to make workplaces thrive. I lasted for about 10 years, and then I quit because I was working so hard, but I was exhausted and I was frustrated. I felt like I spent almost all my time on bureaucracy and on politics, and that the job had so little to do with actually making work better. Now I work from the outside of organizations. I try to help them to do the very thing that I intended to do as an HR professional. But I kept running into HR leaders in my client organizations who were feeling the same things that I was feeling 15 years ago. So last year, as part of my work at The Ready, we talked to more than 100 HR leaders and we kept hearing the same thing about the state of the profession. We kept hearing from them that they're fighting fires instead of focusing on the most strategic work of the business. I was really sorry to hear that the profession that I left 15 years ago hadn't changed that much and that it didn't get a lot better at the top from when I left. Knowing that the folks inside of the HR organizations are wanting change, we started to get really curious about why things haven't changed as much as they should. And the truth lies in that old Deming quote, All systems are perfectly designed for the results that they get. Think about that when it comes to HR. HR's attention and resources are pulled between these two poles. On the one hand, we want responsiveness, right? We want our HR teams to be mitigating risks, ensuring compliance, reacting to emergencies like pandemics and unionization and lawsuits and major disasters. But then on the other hand, we also want innovation. 
We want HR to reimagine the employee experience and design experiential learning and figure out what to do about AI and coach leadership and bring the business into the future of work. And the truth is that HR is meant to do both of these things with limited capacity, limited energy, very different skill sets. And so what we hear is that they don't feel like they can do either at the highest possible level. HR is meant to create an environment where people can do the best work of their lives. But what we know is that the workforce broadly is struggling. Look at these statistics. Employee engagement reached a record high in 2022. So we have that on the one hand. And then on the other hand, we have employee stress also remaining at a record high. How can both of those things be true at the same time? My take is that we have a workforce that is overworking, overcommitted, overly stretched, and trying to regain a sense of control. That's a workforce that's existing in a state of stress response, which means reduced thinking and decision-making capacity, less patience with each other, and higher degrees of burnout. I wonder if that sounds familiar to anybody out there. I know it sounds familiar in the client organizations that I am in and around. The problem with a workforce in that state of both commitment and stress is that it becomes a never ending well of need. And HR, as the first responders, as the firefighters, get stuck in this loop of sort of call and response with a workforce that has too many different kinds of issues and too many humans to effectively serve. And the more you help, the more help is needed. This cycle of dependence gets created that's not good for anyone, but it keeps us very busy and very distracted. So how did we get here? We know that this is not the desire of most human resource professionals, and the truth is that we're still carrying a lot of HR tradition. The very first HR department was called Personnel Management, and it was created by the National Cash Register Company in the early 1900s. It was formed for the reasons you would expect, to handle employee walkouts, big strikes, and, and to deal with worker grievances and firings and safety issues. And, and once workplace laws started to be created for the first time around the Industrial Revolution, personnel was really responsible for training supervisors on the law, those laws. In essence, I'm telling you this because HR was born to manage risk and address crisis, to fight fires. That's where we came from. But the world has changed. Back in the time of the National Cash Register Company, 100 years ago, employees were an afterthought. The real value of a company was 90% in tangible assets. That's up to 1970. That's physical machinery, plants, parts, things we can see and touch. Today, on average, 90% of a company's value is in intangibles. Organizational assets are people and their skills, knowledge, and expertise. And HR is the one who's growing and stewarding and taking care of that resource. And if you include payroll in the HR function, HR holds the biggest P&L in most companies. And yet, it was designed to keep an assembly line running, to treat people like the extension of those machines that are meant to produce widgets. And even though we don't call it personnel now, we call it people and culture or employee experience or people operations, we still see some of those inherited ways of working sticking around. And, and that's part of why HR hasn't yet fully evolved. In order to understand the mismatch between firefighting that HR does and the needs of the modern workforce, we have to understand the difference between these two words. For most people, complicated and complex just describe things that like have moving parts and probably feel confusing. But to an org designer, these words have very different meanings. And if you understand these as contexts at work, as two different kinds of systems, you'll start to think differently about how HR's work gets done. So let's see if we know the difference. Think about a watch, that's one side, or an engine, that's the other photo here. Are these complicated systems or complex systems? I want you to answer in your head because I can't see you. I usually make people yell. 
okay, what about these two? Here on one side, we have weather, and on the other side, we have traffic. Are these complicated systems or complex systems? Well, again, think about your answer based on what you know. All right, now we, now we find out if we got the answers to the quiz, right? Watches and engines are complicated systems. What I mean by that is that they're closed. You can know cause and effect. They have a limited number of parts. If they break, an expert can fix them. A problem can be solved. If you have experience fixing engines, it is unlikely to surprise you. You might not, as a person, know exactly what's wrong with it, but it's pretty unlikely that a clown is going to pop out of it and scare you. Weather and traffic, on the other hand, are complex systems. And I would add to that, human beings, teams, the organizations we work with, these are complex systems. It's hard to trace cause and effect until after the fact. That means that they can't be planned and controlled. We can only sense and respond in complexity. If you have a problem inside of a complex system, you can't solve it. You can only adapt. Weather doesn't change because you planned for it. It doesn't learn because you tell it to. Complex systems are likely to surprise us. So what does that mean for our organizations? It means that HR has to know the difference so we don't attempt to solve complex problems with complicated solutions. What I mean by that is we can't create employee engagement through surveys and checklists. We can't deal with that workforce burnout that we're seeing because we install a wellness program. You can't prevent the next mistake by making a policy based on the last mistake and broadly enforcing it for the rest of time. Organizations are complex, but HR sometimes treats them like they have complicated problems to be solved rather than patterns to be learned from and experimented with. We're stuck between the old days and modernity because we still have to do both. And in between, HR has tried to be everything to everyone and has been asked to be. Now it's the most cross-functional function in any organization. The fact that within most people departments, you have things ranging from employee relations to DEI, wellness, comp, learning, change, transformation, org design, all under one, usually under resourced umbrella, means that it becomes a little bit of a dumping ground for work that doesn't have another home. But when we stretch a mile wide and an inch deep across all of those domains, HR ends up giving the most strategic work the last 5% of its attention. And that's super important because without that focus, we don't have the strategic impact that gets HR the seat at the table driving the business that it should have. HR really holds the key to evolving organizations, but can also be a big blocker. I'm gonna joke about frenemies here, but the truth is in my experience doing this work as, as an external person, we never used to be hired by HR leadership. We were always hired by the CTO or the CEO or the chief product officer. And then usually within a few months, we'd have some kind of like gentle, very professional run-in with the HR leadership team. And we would always think, Oh, we found our people. We share mindsets. We share beliefs. We want the same things for the organization. We should be besties. But often, <laughs> HR was irritated that both we were doing the work that they wanted to be doing, the more strategic, the more transformational work. And at the same time, they didn't have the time to contribute to that work or to be learning from it, to become the capacity for when we left the building. The truth is that firefighters cannot be thinking about fire prevention while the house is burning down. When HR has the time and the resources and the remit, it can be the steward of organizational change. But mostly we see people orgs that are too burnt out to help, much less really lead the charge around this. And besides the systemic considerations, we have the symptoms of that within the, the people people workforce. Look at these statistics. 98% of HR professionals report feeling burnt out. 88% say they dread going to work. Those statistics are twice as bad as the same stats in nursing. That's wild. 97% say they're emotionally drained by their work. This is not the fault of the people in this profession. This is an old method of working, an old 
tradition that has not adapted and is exhausting the people inside of it. Because the strategic work I'm talking about requires space for thinking and for creating and for creating. We need to be able to unlearn old habits and learn new ways of working. And that does not happen in a state of real burnout. Look, we all have had the experience of operating in complexity, whether you knew the difference between those words before today or not. The truth is that we all know that there will be fires. We're going to have pandemics and labor shortages and wars and depressions and AI. We know this and we have to organize human resources in a way that every new threat or opportunity that comes isn't a crisis that further burns out the people in the organization. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our way of thinking about this, just so that we have a shared orientation or map. You can learn a lot more about this on our website. I'll put up a QR code that you can look at at the very end. But the idea here is we have very traditional level one, you know, I call it the call center of HR. The client calls, we answer, we solve their problem. We get them off the phone as quickly as possible. Level two is more like the Ulrich model. This is where we see a business partner that's running interference between the business and the centers of excellence and the external partners and trying to keep everybody happy and provide good client service. We think the big unlock is level three, which is what we call the Hollywood model. This is where we start to see companies separating the urgent from the important and treating them differently. That very first slide that I showed you, the responsiveness and the innovation, the idea here is that we organize differently to provide each of those services really, really well. Think about how movies get made. Think about the internal client up on the top left there as being the producer. They're working with their HR business partner to figure out what the next movies are, what the next strategic priorities are that need to be made for the business. Then HR's role becomes pulling together the movie making team. Who's going to direct? Who's going to act? Who's going to cast? Where are we going to do it? What do we need to get this thing made? The reason that we like this mental model is because movie making is temporary. It encourages us to team dynamically and it forces us to organize contribution around the work rather than trying to organize the work around the org chart. What I mean by that is too often when I see a big initiative around learning or around talent or around hiring, someone has, has created sort of the mission or the movie, but they're chopping it up and spreading it across the org chart rather than saying, this is the body of work and these are the people we need to pull in to do, to do it. The other thing we like about the, the Hollywood model mindset is we know that you can only make the movies that you can actually make with the budget and talent and resources you have. So it forces us to limit work in progress. And we don't stay a team when the work is done. People don't keep hanging out on the movie set saying, should we make another movie once the movie is over? That's good. We want people to come together, do something strategic, and then disband. This is what gives us the flexibility to adapt when there is a fire we weren't expecting. Finally, it really forces us to make the movies that people want to see. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a client organization and there's a beautiful curriculum created but it's created without the business's real involvement. And the users ultimately don't want exactly what's been developed, which is terrible because of all of the time and thought and creativity that's already been invested. We wanna have those users involved. So at clients, we call these mission-based teams, not movies because clients aren't as fun as us. But the idea here is that this is how we adapt in complexity. Now think about the other side of this. This is the platform or in, in the movie parlance, this is the studio. This is the Hollywood studio. It's always on. It's all the infrastructure teams that keep working behind the scenes every day so that creative projects get done. We think of these as the platform teams and what we wanna organize them for is ongoing optimization and efficiency. It's a different mindset than the movie making. And clients say to us all the time, like, yeah, yeah, no, we're doing this. We're making movies, but they're liars. They are not making movies because what they're doing is reacting in crisis. And most of us have had the experience of a crisis coming to our organization and, and everybody swarming around it. It gives us that feeling of cross-functional collaboration, but not a repeatable way of doing it. There's no playbook afterward for how we actually prioritize and identify what the movies are. 
there's no playbook for how we assemble roles and how they come in and out of the project. We have to be able to do this, not just in an emergency. And the idea here is that the work is both identifying missions because we know that organizations are generally not amazing at prioritization, making clear choices and saying no. And then through the life cycle of the mission, having a clarified space away from home base where we can learn new ways of working. When we're coaching a team, a movie making team or a mission based team, as we call them at clients, when we're coaching one of these teams, this is the place where we learn how to clarify roles and decision rights and introduce new meeting structures and make decisions in a different way. We have the freedom because we're there in service of the mission, not in service of the organization that we came from. I'm going to give you a quick example. I worked a number of years ago with a very, very large restaurant organization of, of chain restaurants. And they had a mission, a strategic priority to reduce the time that it took to get menus into the restaurants. I show up, I'm like, menus, I eat out all the time. How hard can this be? It took three months to get menus into restaurants because when you're doing things at scale, uh, it is very difficult. And I learned how just how hard it is. So if you think about actually who needs to be involved in getting menus to updated to 100 restaurants, it's the R&D team testing new dishes. It's the supply chain sourcing the ingredients. It's the finance team modeling the margins. It's the operations team doing distribution. It's the digital team. It's the marketing team. It's the restaurant team that has to train the staff on it. But no one had ever brought the right roles together to create a real workflow, real clarity around authority, and to figure out where the blockages were, how to adapt when the beef didn't show up, how to adapt when the price of strawberries went up, how to adapt when the training team said that the customers didn't like something. And once we had a way of doing that, once we had a way of getting after that mission, the cycle went, time went from three months to two and a half weeks. But more importantly, the people who were involved had a method for making the next movie. Now apply that model to the big learning initiative or talent or hiring or comp initiative that's going on in your company right now. The team shouldn't just be the ones that are designing and building it. The team should include at various points in the movie, those delivering, those end users, the ones who have to maintain it, the ones who have advice or external partners with experience. We want to think more broadly and more flexibly about what it means to organize around the most important work of the business. But in order to do that, we got to put down the fire hose. And the truth is that most haven't. So we've had hundreds of people take our maturity model assessment, and most companies are stuck in level two. 86% are below level three, are below the Hollywood model. And that, I believe, for HR to be stewarding organizations. And here are the things that are jamming folks up. So what we hear is we're better on autonomy, facilitation, communication. We're struggling more with decentralization, automation, and using data. That is not surprising. If you think about everything else we've talked about in the last 20 minutes, the people are great. The people are dialed. The people want to be learning. And they have learned a lot of skills in their history as amazing client service people. But the systems have not caught up. The systems to enable this work have not caught up in the people function. It's going to require us to let go of some of what makes us great influencers and negotiators and coaches and client service people. We're going to have to let go of one-on-one -on -one triaging, of being in that help cycle, of feeling responsible for how other people behave, of waiting for an executive to give us a remit or to fix it. And instead, we're going to have to orient to what is what kind of organizational design would get us those behaviors that we want to find the space where we can be strategic and where we can have enough authority to really have an impact. And that's going to require capabilities that we see as being uneven in HR. <clears throat> to move from firefighting to movie making, we need to have real discipline around experimentation, contracting, like What's in scope? What's out of scope? How do we say no? How do we not try to do all the movies but poorly at one time? Facilitation, 
user experience and design, solution design, automation. Advancing these skills are what will fuel HR teams to keep moving up that maturity model from the Hollywood model and beyond. This is how we move from being a service business that is focused on relationships and keeping clients happy to more of a product business that creates things that serve the whole. And now is the time. As I was prepping for this speech last night, I texted my husband and I asked him to make me an AI image of a flower blooming to end on. He sent me 300 to choose from in under 90 seconds. If y'all aren't making a movie about using AI in your business, you're late. This is the moment to create systems that are designed for human flourishing. The people people will be the ones to do it. And I don't want you to miss it because you're too busy fighting fires. Thank you. Ronnie, I could spend my day just with the capability slide, thinking about it and understanding how to develop. It was very strong, solid, great content. I'm here with Bella from HOTF and we have a couple of questions for you. Hi, nice to meet you. Thank you. And I would like by saying that the person that sent us this question is not alone because his question is the following. What's your advice for an HR that gets overload with operational issues, wants to be strategic, but C-level don't help? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and I hear it, look, I hear it all the time. I hear it all the time. My advice is start small. My advice is find one movie that is important to the business, work on it with the business and see it through to the end. And I know there are people who are like, that's not possible, we don't have the resources. But the reality is you figured it out when COVID happened. You figure it out when there is a flood or a protest or a closure or a strike. We figure it out when we have to. We just don't treat the day to day the same way. So we have to carve out a little bit of space in order to make a movie. But what I find a lot of the time is if we get after one strategic priority, maybe it's one, team, one incentive, one small piece of compensation that we know is not working. Maybe it's one hiring process that we know is taking too long. When we can just get enough resource and enough of those contributing roles to do one thing with protected space, we have the experience of what it can be like. And it becomes a lot easier to sell the business on resourcing us in a way where we can hopefully automate or get rid of some of those operations, where we can maybe have more resource or more capacity dedicated to the next movie. Because the truth is that the end user wants that strategic stuff. They just also want the operational stuff. And ideally, they want you to live in a both and world. And part of the skill of contracting that I put up there is explaining why that's not possible and why we actually can't have both and why in having in doing it the way we're doing it now, we get neither. So start small, carve out the space, do something within your control, do it publicly so people understand that we're trying a new thing and then see how you can scale it from there. Sounds Thank easy. <laughs> no, it's not. So easy. <laughs> Rather, last one about upskilling ourselves and create those new capabilities. What hint would you give to the audience? I mean, it's there's so much things and AI and future of work and how to do that. How to do, we as a group that develop people could develop ourselves. Yeah. Again, my advice is to start small. I you know it be, I find it very overwhelming all of what's going on out in the world and i have the luxury of spending a lot of time reading and thinking and talking to clients and i still find it overwhelming i think in terms of upscaling i would recommend choosing one thing ideally related to something that has to be done anyway so if you have a new learning program that needs to be rolled out that's funded that's committed to that's on a deadline that's a place 
to learn something new. That's a place to say to the group you're working with, what if we try new meeting structures? And you DIY that, you look at liberating structures, you look at all of the great open source stuff that's online, you listen to my podcast and you say, for this project for the next three months, we're gonna try a new operating rhythm. Or you say, let's try to adopt just an easy AI tool like note taking or like visualization. Let's try to automate one part of this process. Do the learning in the work because otherwise it'll be the thing that you delay and postpone and get distracted from. My recommendation for the upskilling is do it as part of something that you're committed to anyway. Rodney, thank you a lot. It was amazing. We have tons of questions here, but we don't have enough time. So we have to do two things. First, you gotta come to Brazil next time. I think we have to spend more time listening to you and all the amazing stuff. I don't think when you go, in, I'm going to put on the chat box at Zoom your podcasts. So it's a lot of interesting things. So keep doing it. We could sometimes do it, ask me anything for the Brazilian audience so we can hear a little bit more about your ideas, your thoughts. Thank you a lot. I would love that. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.